Well, I want to speak this morning on the, uh, about, uh, it's the subject of, why did it please the Father to bruise Jesus? What does that mean? And, of course, it encompasses the wrath of God, the mercy of God, and the love of God. Why did it please the Father? Why did it please God to bruise Jesus? It pleased Him. That's what we're going to see. That's what the Bible says. It's what the Scripture says. But first, I want us, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 real quick. If you throw that up, please. Just, just a way to set the stage and set the scene so you'll understand. And just, many of you already know this, but let's just go over it again, shall we? Well, I'm not asking your permission. We're going to. The Bible says, For he, the Father, made him the Son, who knew no sin. He, for he made him who knew no sin... There, there's something wrong with the back air. It's too big. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Amen? So, God made Jesus to be sin for us, and He's the sinless one. That we might receive His righteousness and be made righteous. Amen? Now, the next John 19.30 says this. says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. That's what He said. It is finished. And bowing His head, He gave up the ghost. Now, what's transpiring here is a holy transaction. You see... Jesus was virgin born. He wasn't cursed like you and me. Everybody in here had a human father. And we trace back to Adam by, from dad to dad to dad to dad to dad to dad to dad, however many dads it takes to get back to the first dad, the first Adam. And because we are all made in the likeness of Adam, we come in this world with the propensity and the bent Towards sin. We are tainted goods. We are, we, are, we, are, we are cursed. That's why the moment a little baby enters, exits mother's womb and enters the world, one thing they all start doing, I'm not talking about crying, they all start dying. They're getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. That's why they grow up. And then we start to fade. <laughs> we start to wither. Now we do. I know, you, I know your pride is, oh, not me. <laughs> look at your high school picture and look at you now. <laughs> and it, it's a direct result of sin. And so we see in that first verse that the Father made Jesus, who was sinless, to become sin for us. That we might receive the righteousness that's only found in Him. Because we're sinners by birth and by action. Jesus wasn't. And so there's a trading, a transaction that's taking place. Everybody with me? Now, the next verse, John 3.36 says this. It says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe, in the, Son, believe the Son shall not see life. And it goes a little bit farther than that. But the wrath of God abides upon him. Now, I want you to understand as clear as I can make it about this verse. Can I tell you the demons believe and they're going to hell? What does it mean to believe in the Son? It means that you are willing to turn from a self-centered, self-absorbed, 
lifestyle and embrace Jesus and your total reliance is upon Him, His finished work, and His perfect person. And He was... He paid for our sin and He rose from the dead and He ascended and He's interceding for all genuine, born again, truly repentant, believing people even to this day. So he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. I'm telling you, if you're a hater, you need to come to Jesus. If you are a uh, you know, if all you can do is tear others down and you think that makes you go up higher, you need a heart transplant. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But I've turned from sin and embraced Christ by faith. I've been born again. That's what, that's what uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, a religious man. It's, it's amazing how Jesus was always been out of shape about religious people. Because religious people are dangerous people. Because, you know, if you think you're going because of how good you are, you're deceived and you're deceiving others. We're going because of how good He is. So, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see, back in, back in 1517, you know, Martin Luther... Uh, uh, a good Catholic boy. Now he was. I mean, and he was genuine. I mean, he wanted to know, but he couldn't find peace and he couldn't find, he couldn't. And then one day he read, therefore being justified by God, by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5, 1. And the light went on and he realized that justification was by grace alone through faith alone. And of course he tried to reform uh, Rome and, and, and the papist, and they'd have nothing of it, and they'd want to hunt him down and, bar and have barbecue. And he's the barbecue. And hence, a reformation began. A reformation of biblical Christianity. And we've had others since then, too. Thank God. What it is to believe, to believe, will you will change your heart, it'll change your mind, it'll change your walk, it'll change your way. And if that hasn't changed, you believe like a demon does. They tremble. It shakes them up because they know he, I mean, every time Jesus come in around where there uh, demonic activity and they want to cry out, oh no, it's him, it's the son of God. He says, shut up. And they'd shut up. Go get in that herd of swine and go, go commit hoggy side. And that's what they did. Run down into the lake and drown themselves. You see what I mean? Boy, I tell you, when you meet the king, he becomes king. Everybody with me? Now, 2 Peter 3, 9. The scripture says this. Because people, because I hear this all the time, week in, week out, it doesn't, you know, well, if they're a Christian, why can they do that? And how could God let that happen? And, you know, the, the poor, puny, piney, whiny, pitiful me song. You know what I mean? Well, if, well, if, well, if, well, if. This, this answers it. This answers it. The Scripture says the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some count slackness. You know? The Lord's, you know, He's not on vacation. He's not asleep. He's not old and feeble. He's not out to lunch. You know, He's not late clocking back in. You know, I mean, He's there. But the Scripture says, but He's long-suffering toward us, humanity. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all, everyone you know, everyone you see, would come to repentance. You see, you can't have Bible faith without Bible repentance. You can't have Bible repentance without Bible faith. 
I mean, when one is spoken, the other is implied. And you cannot separate them. Without repentance, there's no faith. And without faith, there's no real repentance. All you're doing is turning over a leaf. The problem is it's the same sorry leaf. We need changed. And we need transformed. Amen? Now, let's go to my... Uh, how'd you like my introduction? Let's go to the text now. Isaiah 53. And look what the scripture says. Now remember, it pleased him, God the Father, to bruise him, God the Son. And the longer I think about that, you know, when I first run against that, I, it, it just blew me away years ago. What year is this? This is 20, this is, huh? Okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, it, it passed me, and I didn't know. I just completed 39 years of preaching. Started, I'm in my 40th year of preaching the gospel. It happened last week, by the way, last Sunday, but that's okay. And years 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 ago, when I first come across that scripture, that just, I, I just, it did not compute. And I didn't, I, I, oh my, didn't, I didn't, didn't like it, didn't understand it. I mean, I mean, my goodness, is, is, uh, is God a sadist? I mean, you understand? It pleased him. To bruise him. And I had to, but thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the written, inspired, God breathed book we call the Bible. And one won't contradict the other, by the way. Now, Isaiah speaks out and he says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Two rhetorical questions. And I say, yea, God, he's revealed himself to me. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Speaking of Jesus, these, these are prophetic verses. And the root out of dry ground. And then it just kind of shifts and it says, and he has no former comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Remember what he looked like after they got done with beating him and torturing him all night the night before and beating him and then they suspended him to the tree people could look on him who knew him and walked with him and couldn't recognize him and the scripture says he is despised and rejected by men it's amazing to me a week before they're saying hosanna Hosanna is a, is a word that means, come and deliver us. Bless your name, O Holy One. Yeah, they, they, they thought he was the political solution. I'm telling you, there's no political solution. There's a Jesus solution. I would to God everybody running for office was born again, but they're not. But I wish God would raise up more. I mean, I figured out why they hate Scott Walker and Ted Cruz so much. Both of them are pastor's sons. Well, we want none of them crazy people. They believe in the Bible. They believe in the resurrection. They believe, they believe in salvation. They believe in hell, heaven and hell. Like our founding fathers. Like our founding fathers got it wrong. God help us. Amen? God help us. He's despised and rejected my men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And, he, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Mm -mm -mm. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, look there, smitten by God and afflicted. All the pain, all the anguish, all the torture that Jesus embraced, experienced, and suffered was God's plan. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. You see... Isaiah, the Holy Spirit's telling Isaiah why all this was done. 
It was done for you. And everybody you know and everybody you don't know. It was done for you. This was done for us. And then he reminds us. And I want you to notice this verse begins and ends with the same word. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Where I live, how I live, where I work, it's my money, it's my time, it's my talent. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, all, everyone, everyone, we're in the same boat. We're placed there. We come into the world in the same boat. Every last one of us. And the scripture says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth and he didn't. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd probably have a word or two to say. Scripture says he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. How many people here have ever been around sheep shearing? Then you know what you know that's true. Sheep are just dumb. I mean, and I'm well, they're not the brightest animal on the farm either. But I mean they're just compliant. They just sit there and you and then you give them that haircut, that wool cut. I mean, you know, and you know what? They'll stand right there while you slit their throat, too. Lamb of God. Remember, remember the sacrificial lamb. Obedient and compliant unto death. That was Jesus. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. <laughs> see, you see, they had a hole they put criminals in. Well, it wasn't really a hole. It was just a trash heap, and they were consumed by the fire. That's where Jesus should... But Joseph of Arimathea, a rich, a rich man, a religious man. But I think he was a follower of Jesus and came and took a Pontius Pilate and begged the body of Christ. And so he was put in a rich man's tomb. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how God can write history in advance? And people say God's not real. <sighs> you know... A lot of these secularists, these atheists uh, that, that are in education, they say, well, I can't see it. If I can't see it, it ain't so. Well, I can't see your brain. That must mean it ain't so. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> because he had done no violence, nor any deceit was in his mouth. That was Jesus. Now look here at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. He will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Hallelujah. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession with the transgressors. Now, I want you to understand something. Something that, that if you get straight in your head, you will walk freer and in more power. Wouldn't you like to know what it is? Well, three of you would. 
See me after service. When the Father and the Son and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the Godhead, the triune God, they conceived this plan in eternity past. And I can't, you know, I'm, I'm already in water way over my head. Can't wrap my brain around this. And they, they said... You know, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to create that. And we're going to do this and all of these things. And this is going to be the object of my affection, mankind. And they're going to be in a perfect place. And it, they're going to have it made. We're just going to ask one thing of them. And they're going to blow it. Now, if you or I were there, we'd say, well, just let them burn in hell forever. Start over. But that's not the love of God. That's not the God of love in the Bible. And they knew that the plan had to be because he's holy and he's righteous. God is holy. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are holy and sinless and righteous. A plan had to be to redeem mankind. And it meant there was only one who could pay it. Not another woman born, man sown child. It had to be God. And so God had to identify with humanity. And he was the Holy Spirit over, overshadowed the Virgin Mary. And in a miraculous way, she conceived and God became a human being. I, I know it does not compute. It just I know God can do anything but fail. And there's nothing too hard for God. And the scripture declares it. I believe it. Okay. And she remained a virgin until she gave birth. Now you, Wow. And Jesus fulfilled the law, lived the law perfectly, did not sin, and for 33 years was sinless. You think 33 minutes is tough. 33 years. I kind of think that's probably how long Adam lasted. That's hypothesis. I can't be dogmatic about that. But Jesus is called the last Adam. And so here he is, lived a perfect life, sinless, beaten, tortured, humiliated, beard ripped out, a, a cap of thorns jammed down on his head. He's, he's just, he's beaten to where he's unrecognizable. There's no bone broken, but he's disjointed a whole bunch of ways. And then Jesus was taken to a cross, and they, run, they ran spikes through him. And they elevated him on a cross. And if you were here, you heard the seven last sayings of Christ from the cross. And in one of them, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he always referred to God as father, except there, when he talked to him. It was Abba, it was father. But now it's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Jesus didn't stop being God, but he did, as a human being, set aside all his divine attributes and walk this earth as a, as a, as a human being. And when he was 30 years old and he went down into the river to be baptized of John, the Spirit of God came on him. And those last three years, he walked as a Spirit-filled man. And now, he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to understand this. The wrath of God was on display. 
Do you understand what I mean by wrath? God absolutely hates sin. That's why we're redefining it and calling it something new. But God hates sin. And I, and you, I know immediately you think of abortion and homosexuality, but I'm telling you, He hates your sin and mine too. And He put the penalty of all that sin on Jesus. He poured His wrath upon Him. He poured out His anger upon Him. He poured out hell upon Him. And He took our place that we who repent and believe never have to worry about that wrath again. Oh, I'm telling you, God is so on your side. He wants to bless you. He wants to use you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to teach you. He wants to show you. He wants to help you. He wants to do all manner of things for you. Why? Because the wrath that you deserve, Jesus took. Because His anger was consumed upon the cross. And now, what does He have for you? Love. Mercy, tenderness, forgiveness. A lot of people, when they, when they think of God, they think of some long-bearded, grumpy old geezer that, that didn't get enough sleep and is half hung over. Now that's your picture of God. And that is not the God of the New Testament. Mercy and love. He thinks good thoughts. He has great plans for you. Now, I know, what, I know what some of you think. Oh, now, preacher, you're telling us we have a license to sin. I am not. And here's why. Even though his wrath and his anger was satisfied on the cross, everything you do is a seed. Is a seed. And that harvest will come. I hope it's good seed you're sowing. Because if you sow... If you sow selfish seed, you sow, you sow wicked seed, you sow the seed that does not glorify God, that harvest is going to come back on you. Yeah, he still loves you, but you can't blame God for it. You know, it's just like a fella, uh, you know, I mean, we all have moments of crisis, don't we? What does a fallen, what's our fallen flesh want to say? Well, God, if you really love me, you wouldn't let this happen. Right? And God says, I do love you. But you know that seed that you sown? I didn't make you an alcoholic. I didn't give you cancer. I didn't give you high blood pressure. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. All of those things are a result of sin. Started in the garden, and we just pass it down from generation to generation. You can't blame God for that. Well, Lord, I wish my wife was better. Well, won't I be better to her? And, of course, I know there's some wives who will say, but my husband, you just don't understand. Yeah, I do. He's like me. I understand perfectly. I can identify with the husband a lot easier than I can a woman for obvious reasons. That's why I always have Sweetie Babe in there when we're doing marital counseling. <laughs> Ding a ling. We got a text from heaven that says, Amen. Now, I can't help it. <laughs> God hates sin. And he's dealt with that hatred, that anger. And he poured it out upon his son, Jesus. But it'll only work. Now listen, this, 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 if you didn't hear anything, hear this. But it will not work. For the person who has not honestly and genuinely repented of sin 
and put their faith in Jesus Christ. You hear me? Now, preacher. And I know there's this, there's this damnable doctrine called universalism. Everybody's going to be saved. Well, you know, if that's true, then God is a murderer. He killed Jesus for nothing. No, everybody's not going to be saved. But the Lord wants everyone to be saved. But because we are made in His image, we have a responsibility to either cooperate and embrace Him under the authority of His inner word, believe Him, make it real in our lives, or we just continue to go our way. We're our God. We make our own, our own standard, our own rules. We, make, we, we decide what's good and bad. You know, we, we take a poll and we see what's good and what's bad and what's acceptable. It doesn't matter if the whole world says something's right. If God says it's wrong, it's still wrong. In Romans 14, 23, the scripture says this. I want you to understand this. The Apostle Paul tells us, says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Now, he's talking about uh, the question here in the context. I was, I was, I always got to be honest with the context. Is what about meats offered to idols? Okay, that's the context. You can go back and read it yourself on your own time. He says, because he does not eat from faith. And the last line is the kicker. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Do you hear me? Whatever is not of faith is sin. And then earlier in the book, in, in Romans chapter 2, in verse 5, he says this. He says, but in accordance with your hardness, you know what will keep you from being born again, being saved? Your hardness of heart. You're saying, no, God, I'm going to do it my way. You know, you got Frank Sinatra-itis. You want to do it your way. God says, go right ahead. But your way won't take you to heaven. You're made in my image. You got, the, you, you got the freedom to choose, but with choice comes responsibility and either blessings or consequences. They're all tied together. In accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, that, that's a word we don't use a whole lot, but it just simply means unrepentant. Impenitent. Impenitent heart. You are, now look here, treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now this is resurrection day. And I know, I know way back yonder I have oh, emails, 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 Facebook messages, tweets and twitters and flitters and I know Easter is from a pagan God. I know where the word comes from. And I know why the church adopted it. And I know how it got to be called Easter. So if you're one of those, we'll call it Resurrection Day. Okay? Resurrection Day. But the world calls it Easter. Okay? All right? Three days before, the wrath of God for every true, repentant, believing sinner who becomes a child of God. See, I hear people say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, I, I was a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. Now I'm a saint of God who has to deal with sin. I'm no longer in the devil's family. I'm in God's family. Do you understand? Now, he says, in a... Because the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus for me. Now I, I can come to my Father who loves me, who knows everything about me, and still loves me. 
and receives me and embraces me. He loves me so much, he doesn't want me to stay like I am. You see, that's why that, you know, that 50 cent word, that theologian word, sanctification comes in. That I become more like him, set apart more to him, and set apart more from a fallen, lost world. You see, that's why, you know, I, I love everybody, and I really do, and I, I, I can be friends with anybody, but there's some things, some things I don't do in some places I don't go. And I could do it. I could do it and not sin against God. But if a weaker brother sees me, it'll cause him to stumble. Do you hear what I'm saying? Or if a lost person sees me, you know what they'll say? You know a good blankety blank hypocrite. That's what they say. You can fill in the blanks with anything. I've heard them all. You know. My goodness, there's so many secret agents out there wanting to come and tell me about my church members. <laughs> Do you know? And usually I say, yes, I know. So why are you wasting your breath and your time? He's my brother. She's my sister. And God's forgiven them. And he loves them, and I love them, and he loves you. The problem's not them, the problem's you. That's why, we th that's why the world thinks we're a bunch of kooks around here. Because we actually believe the Bible's the Word of God, and there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. And that he died, and he was buried, and he rose again, and he's ascended to heaven, and bless God, he's coming a second time. Amen? Woo, let's land this plane. Now, let me say this. The wrath of God. Throw that last verse back up there, please. It disappeared on me. Okay. If you have not genuinely been saved, and I'm not talking about being baptized. If water makes you a Christian, go on to McDonald's and make you a Big Mac. I mean, doing stuff... Doing, doing. I've been, I've gone through confirmation. I've, I've been catechized and homogenized and sanitized. I've done all these things. I've jumped through all the hoops. I've rung all the bells. Everything that this church says and that church says and this denomination and that denomination. And you know, I, I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm just telling you there's only one thing that will take you to heaven. And that is for you personally by faith, say, Lord, I believe in you. What did the thief on the cross? Pastor Don said it wonderfully at Friday night. The thief on the cross didn't pray a sinner's prayer. Although I'm not against praying a sinner's prayer. Don't misunderstand me. He just he realized, hey, we deserve what we get. And this man's innocent. And then he acknowledged, he said, Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord of glory, the King of kings, the Savior of the world said, Today, bud, you're going to be with me in paradise. He didn't get baptized. He didn't get confirmed. He didn't do a lot of things. Now, if he, ever got, if he could have got down from there, there's a lot of things he should have done and could have done and would have done. You know? But tithing's not taking you to heaven. It's not. You know, giving offerings. You know, we're getting ready to take a team to Honduras and people are giving. There's eight or nine of us going. And, and, I, and I think two have, have it paid in full, but the other six or eight or however many don't. We're still raising money. You know, and there's people helping with that. And that's wonderful. That'll not take you to heaven. You know, you can work in orphanages like we do like others in this house does, or, and, and help build them and build churches and do all these things, that won't take you to heaven. You've got to personally come by faith and say, Lord, and the word confess means more than just saying some words. It means to agree with. Lord, I agree with you. I am a sinner. Lord, I agree with you. 
I am what you say I am. I am not perfect. I'm far less than perfect. And Lord, I need your help. I need your help. I need you to forgive me and to save me. I need you to change me. I've tried to change myself so many times. I can't do it. But Lord, I'm going to trust you to do it. If you've never done that, can I tell you what's waiting on you? The wrath of Almighty God. Not me. (laughs) I dodged that bullet. Jesus took my wrath. How could anyone say no to the one who loves them the most, yet the, the earth is full of them? If you're here this morning and you've not said yes to Jesus, I ask you to say yes today. Listen, I'm glad God doesn't read church signs. He's not a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Methodist, a Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Assembly God, Charismatic, or whatever else there is out yonder. He's God. And He has children. And if you'll come and embrace Him by faith, you say, Pastor, I want to do that, but I'm just confused. I'm just not clear. Listen, she's going to start singing in a minute if if she ever shows up. Come out, come out wherever you are, Natalie. <clears throat> you can, I'm going to be right here, and I will, I will meet with you. I'll pray with you. We can kneel at this altar. I'll show you what the Word of God says. How you can know you pass from death unto life. And it's, it's a transaction between you and Jesus. And can I also tell you, he's a healer, as we read in in, in Isaiah 53, he's a healer. By your stripes, we were healed. And I'm telling you, he's a deliverer. You know, if you're full of hate, insecurity, condemnation, if you, if you feel like, you know, your life it can't be good unless you're putting someone else down, that's demonic activity in your life. And the Lord will set you free. He will set you free. If you'll recognize it for what it is and come to the one who can change you and do something about it. He can save, he can heal, and he can deliver.